Hello Primary 6 and welcome to the first reading of our new class novel. Um, we chose this book because it is set in Scotland and we wanted something to go alongside our Jacobite topic and we'll be doing Scottish poetry this month. So this is a really nice book based in Scotland and a nice um, adventure book as well. So it's called Light on Damayet and it's written by Rennie McCowan. Okay, so I'm just gonna read the blurb from the back of the book here, just so we get an idea of what the book is about. It was then that Gavin's adventure began. For halfway up the hill, the peak that Aunt Elspeth called Damayet, he suddenly saw a light. It winked for a moment and then disappeared. Gavin lay still. It must have been a shooting star or his imagination. Then the light appeared again. It flashed twice and then disappeared. But who would have a light up there? No one lived there. Could it be poachers or smugglers? Tomorrow he would climb Dumayet and find out. Gavin meets Claire, Michael and Mott for the first time when he spends the summer holidays at the home of his aunt and uncle in a wild and beautiful part of the Scottish countryside. Their adventures together are only just beginning. So let's find out what the book is about. Chapter one is called Northwards Bound. The owl sat on the pine tree branch, alert and stirring uneasily. The dawn wind whispered softly through the branches and ruffled the owl's feathers. Scudding clouds held back the morning sun and the woods were gloomy and black. A man lay at the bottom of the tree. He did not see the owl hidden in the branches. Even the yellow glow of its searching eyes did not penetrate the darkness. The man was busy. He lay full length dressed in black clothing. His face and hands were covered in black suit so that he blended in with his surroundings. The owl prepared for flight as the man pushed and pulled at the dead brushwood and branches lying around and arranged them in a screen in front of him. The man pulled binoculars out of a rucksack and began to polish the lenses with a handkerchief he took from his pocket. The owl launched itself from the tree and glided silently through the branches, seeking a safer place to hole up during the day. The sun grew brighter as the man parted the branches and examined the view ahead. The fringe of woodland lay at the top of a hill. From it he could look over rolling countryside, part heathery moor, part green and fertile farmland and part forest. Small whitewashed farms nestled in protected hollows. The grey stones of a large mansion house dominated the foreground and in the distance were the buildings of a large town. It was a peaceful scene. Then, breaking the silence, came the low, rumbling sound of a train speeding in the distance. The man craned forward as the roar of the train grew closer. His binoculars closely scrutinised the mansion house. He saw the door open and a woman come out. She got into an estate car parked beside the front door. In the stillness of the summer morning, he heard the car door slam and the engine start. The car disappeared around a bend in the drive. The man took out a notebook and wrote busily in it. Then he settled down in his den of branches and continued his vigil. Now and again, he moved uncomfortably and his face was angry. Gavin could not make up his mind whether to be an ancient Pict or an ancient Roman. Both had lived and fought in the hills where he was going. As the train moved swiftly northwards, he passed the time by sleeping or by examining the luggage he was taking on holiday. He had not wanted to go to Scotland, but he'd had little choice. He remembered the day well when a letter came cancelling the family holiday. His mother had come into the dining room with the bad news. She stood beside the breakfast table for a moment, then she told him what had happened. Gavin, I'm very, very sorry, but we cannot go on holiday to Anglesey as planned, she said. 
Daddy has been called away on business and I must stay at home for part of the time. Can't I stay at home too, Gavin asked. Well, Gavin, I think you would get fed up. Then his mother paused. But I have an idea. I have phoned Aunt Elspeth and Uncle Fergus in Scotland and asked if you could have a holiday with them. They live in a wonderful old house beside hills. You could camp and climb and have plenty of fun. What do you think? Gavin considered this for a moment. At Anglesey, they were going to stay in a cottage and swim and play in an old boat that Daddy had bought. Scotland seemed rather tame, but he decided he might as well go. Why don't you write to Aunt Elspeth? She loves getting cards and letters. Say you would like to come and ask her all about it, suggested his mother. So Gavin sent a letter. It was short. He hoped Aunt Elspeth was well and he was looking forward to come in and what luggage should he bring. Aunt Elspeth's reply surprised him. It was a very long letter. Gavin had never had such a long letter before. It covered four pages of notepaper and contained lots of exciting information. Gavin took the letter up to his bedroom, sprawled on his bed and read what Aunt Elspeth had to say. She wrote, You'll like it here. There's no one in the house but Uncle Fergus and myself. He's writing a book so you won't see much of him. You can stay in the spare room in the tower. It is right at the top and looks over the hills. Nearby are the Ockle Hills. They are quite lonely. No one lives there except for some sheep and a fox or two. If you're interested in bird watching, it is a splendid place. There are curlews on the moors, owls in the woods and hawks and buzzards on the hills. Be sure to bring strong boots, an anorak and plenty of old clothes. There are many places to explore, including some old silver mines in the hills. They are quite safe. All the dangerous tunnels have now been blocked up. Gavin threw down the letter. His eyes gleamed. He was thrilled. Lonely hills, woods to explore, silver mines and birds. Recently, he'd become quite interested in birds and had visited the London Museums, identifying the species he saw in his gardens and in the parks. He picked up the letter again. I'm afraid there are not many children nearby, but I expect you will make some friends. If you want to, I can take you on an outing to Stirling and you can visit the Great Castle and see the cannons and the dungeons. Gavin smiled with pleasure. A castle nearby? And Scotland sounded better and better. His mind was made up. He would spend the holiday being an explorer. It was almost as if Aunt Elspeth could read his mind. He read on. Long ago, she wrote, ancient tribes lived in the hills. They were known as Picts and they were very fierce warriors. They wore clothes made of skins and painted their bodies and faces. The Romans, when they conquered Britain, also came to these hills, but they were never able to settle for long. The Picts defeated them in battle. Aunt Elspeth went on. I don't know whether you're interested in all this at all, but I know boys like to explore and play games, so perhaps you could play at being a Pict or a Roman. Gavin put down the letter. Aunt Elspeth sounded good fun. Yes, he would go to Scotland. He shouted downstairs, Yes, Mum, I'd love to go. And so it was arranged. Gavin sat with his face pressed to the window as the train moved swiftly past green fields and small towns. Gradually, the landscape changed, taking on a harsher look. Grass gave way to stretches of moorland covered in heather and gorse. The train guard, whom Gavin's parents had asked to keep an eye on him during the journey, came along and pointed out some small lochens glinting in the sunlight as the train sped by. His mother, still feeling he was sorry about not getting to go to Anglesey, had taken him to a large mountaineering shop where there were rows, rows of anoraks in dazzling colours, red, orange, blue and green, and shelves of tough-looking hiking boots. Trays held metal rock-climbing gear, 
whistles and a variety of knives and cooking equipment. Gavin wandered around in a happy daze while his mother made purchases. Now, against the backdrop of the chugging train, he spread his new equipment out on the seat and gloated. One dark green anorak. Gavin had rejected the bright colours. The assistant had said that they were bright so that they could be seen in the hills. If climbers have an accident, they can be easily spotted, he said. Gavin always almost said that he was an ancient Pict and did not want to be seen. But what he said was, I am a very keen bird watcher and I want to be camouflaged. Oh, in that case, a green one would be best, said the assistant and wrapped up the green anorak. If you're a bird watcher, you might like to look through our book section, she added. So Gavin walked through to a nearby room and examined the piles of books stacked from floor to ceiling. He'd saved his pocket money for many weeks since Aunt Elspeth's letter, so he carefully counted it out. He had enough for three small books. He bought a pocket-sized book of birds, a book on animal tracks and a book on hill walking and camping. His mother paid for the other equipment. Putting his anorak down on the carriage seat, Gavin opened up the pockets. In one was a compass with a luminous dial and arrow. He had already tried it out under the bedclothes in his room. In another was a mountaineer's torch with a headset rather like a miner's lamp. Three loops went over his head with the torch sitting just above his forehead. The head torch felt odd at first, but Gavin soon began to get used to it and realised just how useful the torch would be. The beauty of the head torch was that it could be worn whilst the hands were free to climb or to do anything else. Very necessary for an explorer, Gavin thought, especially one who might explore a silver mine. In another pocket of his anorak were a whistle and a black camping knife. The knife had two blades, a tin opener and a file. He pulled out his new boots. They were brown with rubber soles deeply cut into an indented pattern to prevent slipping. Although they were heavy, they hardly made any sound. Gavin kept his best treasures until last. His mother had bought him a sleeping bag and a set of Dixies in case he got the chance to cook on a wood fire out of doors. The set of Dixies did not look very much at first sight. Actually, Gavin thought, it looked like just one pan. But when it was opened up, there was another smaller pan fitted inside and a cup inside that. Inside the cup was a small egg-shaped container dotted all over with little holes. It was an infuser. The idea was to put tea inside it, then lower it into a pan of boiling water to brew for a minute or so. It had a little chain and hook for pulling it out. Gavin liked the idea of using this and the infuser was a clever way to stop him burning himself. Also inside the pan was a strong clamp for gripping hot pans. It was called a bulldog. Gavin laid the Dixies out in a row. It seemed impossible that so much could be within one pan. He counted them. One frying pan, the outside piece, with its handle which closed the lid of the whole set. One deep cooking pan with lid, which could also be used as a plate. One cup, one tea infuser and one bulldog. He put them together again, closed the handle with a satisfying clang and stowed them in his rucksack. The sleeping bag was very expensive. It was made of quilted down and tapered towards the foot. Once you got into it, little tapes at the top pulled it tight around the shoulders. It was very warm. Gavin had spent one night in it to try it out. He was so busy examining his equipment that when he next looked out of the window, the train was near the edge of a town and he could see what looked like a large river nearby. Above the roofs of the houses was a large crag. On it stood a castle. On a little hill nearby, he could see two cannons. In the distance, he could see hills. Next minute, the train was slowing to a halt in a large station. Stirling! Stirling! 
shouted the guard as he passed the window. Gavin grabbed his case, swung his rucksack onto his back and left the train. He had that excited feeling that began every holiday. What he did not know was that he was about to start the most exciting time of his entire life. Chapter 2 The Mysterious Light Before Gavin could gather his wits, Hans grabbed his case. I'm Aunt Elspeth, said a voice. Standing in front of him was a pleasant looking lady of about his mother's age. She was wearing a tweed skirt and jacket and had a little green hat on her head. You must be Gavin, she said. You are very welcome. Give me your case and rucksack and we'll put them in the car. She led the way out to the station car park. In one corner was a large estate car. Aunt Elspeth opened the rear door and heaved Gavin's luggage inside. Hop in the front, she said. Gavin carefully opened the door on his side and put on his seatbelt. Soon they were driving through the busy streets of Stirling. Gavin saw a great castle on a huge rock way above the road. Aunt Elspeth said, that's Stirling Castle. We will visit there while you are here. It's built on that great rock or crag, which is millions of years old. Gavin thought the castle looked amazing, perched high up above the road. Aunt Elspeth said, you can see the countryside for miles from, from up there. And that's why it was such an important strategic castle hundreds of years ago. Soon they left the houses behind. The road narrowed and began twisting uphill. He liked the way Aunt Elspeth drove, swinging the car deftly around the bends. As they drove along, Gavin gazed eagerly from side to side. On each side of the road were large woods of firs and spruce, dark green and black. Behind them he could see the tops of hills, grey and scattered with boulders. Suddenly Aunt Elspeth turned the car sharply off the road and through a gate bounded on either side by two huge stone pillars. This is our drive, she said. It runs through the woods for about half a mile to the house. There's nobody here but us. There's a farm over the hill which can be reached by a path, path through the woods. Nobody at all, said Gavin. Surely somebody must live nearby. Aunt Elspeth glanced at him. Oh, you won't be lonely, she said. There are some children on the farm and a bus passes the end of our drive twice a day. You can go into Stirling at any time you want. She gave him a kindly glance. Whenever you feel like a jaunt, just let me know. We have a home help and she helps me with the meals, so I'll be able to come with you sometimes. Have you any special plans? Yes, said Gavin. I want to explore the hills. The hills? Well, you'll have a splendid time. But don't go out of sight of the house, will you, until you know the area. People have been lost there. We don't want to spoil your holiday by calling out a search party for you. Gavin reached over the seat and put his hand in the rucksack pocket. He produced the compass. Aunt Elspeth laughed. I see you are prepared. Can you use it? Gavin nodded. He'd practised using a compass and map in a park at home. Well, that's good because the hills are new to you. So your compass is essential, said Aunt Elspeth. Anyway, it's early to bed tonight. Tomorrow I'll make you some sandwiches and a flask of tea. Then you can explore as much as you like. You do know you should never go hill walking without a hot drink and food, don't you? It's just in case the temperature suddenly drops or you get into difficulty. The car stopped in front of a large stone house. Gavin eyed it with interest. It had three storeys and a high roof. At one end was a round tower and there were real battlements. Ivy covered most of the tower. It had one window near the top. Aunt Elspeth saw him looking. That's your window, she said. And if you feel like climbing down the ivy, don't. It's not very strong. And I don't want to write to your mother telling her that you've had an accident. For the second time that day, Gavin promised to be careful. A pebble covered drive ran right through the house with large flower beds in front. The woods surrounded it on all sides. They looked deep and peaceful. Gavin listened in delight. There was no sound but a soft whispering from the trees 
and the deep crooning of wood pigeons in the distance. The rest of the day passed in a sleepy haze. Gavin was tired out by his journey. Aunt Elspeth led the way to his room. It was small, with thick walls papered in bright colours. His bed was against one wall. These are the ochles, said Aunt Elspeth, pointing out the window. Gavin peered out. Beyond the trees and dwarf in the house lay a range of hills. They were like a huge frozen green wave, he thought. He studied their steep flanks, seamed with little cliffs and covered with clumps of gorse and boulders. Half hidden by a cluster of tall pine trees, he could make out a rocky pointed peak at the end of the range. What's that? he asked Aunt Elspeth. She came over to the window. Oh, that's Damayat, she said. Long ago there was a tribe of picks called the Mayate. They built a fort on top of that hill. It overlooks the Fourth Valley and then northwards to the Grampian Mountains. A Pictish fort is called a dun, she continued. So now, so that's how the hill got its name, the dun of the Mayatai. Since then, it's become slurred into Damayat, pronounced dumb I at. Aunt Elspeth said Gavin, how do you know all this? Oh, I used to roam these hills too when I was a girl, she said. I love the hills. So do you, I think. It must be your mother's blood in you. She loved the hills as well. Aunt Elspeth laughed. Some of your cousins didn't. When they came to stay here, they couldn't sleep. They thought the hills were going to fall on them. Gavin chuckled. Yet he could understand their feelings. The hills did appear to lean over the house. They frowned, he thought. You'll meet Uncle Fergus in the morning, said Aunt Elspeth. Now get to sleep. I'll call you early and show you all over the house. You'll have plenty of time to explore. Gavin lay in his narrow bed and gazed at the hills. Now that it was dark, there were just a blue black mass against the sky. A few stars twinkled palely. Dark night clouds drifted slowly across the sky. It was then that his adventure began. Halfway up the hill, the peak that Aunt Elspeth had called Damayet, he suddenly saw a light. It winked for a moment and then disappeared. Gavin lay still. It must have been a shooting star or his imagination. Then the light appeared again. It flashed twice and then disappeared. Gavin jumped out of bed. He opened the window quietly and leaned out. All was still. From a farm, a dog barked twice. The pines sighed softly. From the woods came the hoot of a tawny owl. Gavin studied the hills again. They remained black and silent. Then the light flashed again. He saw it clearly. But who would have a light up there? No one lived there, Aunt Elspeth had said so. Could it be poachers or smugglers? Anyhow, no one burned a, late, a light late at night in those lonely hills without good reason. Then an idea struck him. Tomorrow he would climb Damayet and see if he could find out what the mysterious light was. It would give him something to do. He could try out his new equipment. He wouldn't say anything to Aunt Elspeth. He would enjoy the mystery himself. Once he found out, he would tell her. As sleep overcame him, one thought was uppermost in his mind. How to find the light. He struggled out of bed again, reaching for his anorak. He searched inside his pocket. Out came a pencil. Peering up at Damayet, he scribbled a tiny arrow on the wallpaper at the side of the window. It pointed to where he had last seen the light. It was a funny sort of light, thought Gavin, as he drifted off to sleep. It was almost as if someone had opened the door of a lighted room and then shut it again quickly. So there we go, the first two chapters of our new novel. Um, hope you've enjoyed that and we'll catch up soon and have a chat about it.